everyone. Happy Friday. Maggie, it's Friday. How you feeling? <laughs> TGIF. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm in TGIF mode, even though we all well know that the movie and TV news never stops. We're all Ain't here. <laughs> yeah, all here, all covering pretty much 24-7. <laughs> I think it's I think it's partly because we can't help ourselves. Every it's single time I'm like chill out, sit down and don't do anything, then I like find a show to watch for fun and then somehow I turn that fun show into work because I really like it. Yeah, I've done that many times. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone on that. So, we've got a bunch of things to cover today, beginning with our title topic dune to reaction so the social media embargo has lifted for the film which means twitter is absolutely flooded with reactions right now i have carved out a couple here to read off um this first one comes from rosa para who goes by rosa's reviews on twitter highly recommend following rosa mm -hmm. Dune 2 is an epic, masterful cinematic experience. It's visceral, palpable, and must be seen on the biggest screen possible. Watched it a few days ago, and I'm still riding, I'm still riding the high of that experience. The rich mythology, acting, and story are all elevated by the visuals and sound design. We also have Courtney Howard, who's got a two-parter for us. Dune 2 is jaw-dropping, breathtaking, and wildly exhilarating. It's an adrenaline rush to the head and heart, soaring in its spectacle-driven action sequences as much as, it so as much as it sings in its redefined evocative stillness. Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya turn in singular work. Austin Butler is absolutely transformative, captivating, and seductively evil. Yet another compelling performance from Dave Bautista, Rebecca Ferguson, tears up the screen, rising to commanding power. Florence Pugh turns in career best work. There's lots of interesting little tidbits here. I, like, I find it quite striking that that one ended with Florence Pugh turns in career best work because, I mean, she's top tier talent across the board for me. She is, yeah. Hmm. Any any big takeaways from from those reactions or any others that have crossed your your eye? I can't remember which critic it was who said it, but I saw at least two people referencing Dune in comparison to Lord of the Rings, particularly when it comes to fight sequences. And I will say that was perhaps the first time I've been genuinely interested in seeing Dune. Uh, so really oh. kudos to those critics for comparing it to something that I think is very beloved and like, you know, we have a touchstone to kind of call back to and reference. Uh, so that actually made me really excited for Dune too. So are you not into Dune? I'm not a Dune girl, um, you know, which is so funny since I love sci-fi. Yeah, yeah, it surprises me. <laughs> um, I think it was I tried to read the book when I was a kid and then I tried to read it as an adult in college and it was just so dense and I didn't really get into it. And I, I saw Dune and I was like, well, this is fine. But I don't think because I have that like love and like passion for it that a lot of fans of Dune have that it wasn't like, you know, opening weekend i have to go see it i waited for it to come out on streaming so uh okay. this actually made me some of these reviews made me really want to see it in theaters this time yeah around. um here here's one that really piqued my interest and and i'm i'm someone who really liked the first dune movie um because of that movie i read the i read the book listened to the audio book um mike ryan wrote i was kind of mixed on the first dune dune part two is phenomenal up there with the greatest sci-fi movies i've ever seen i want to ride a sandworm um that's a that's a big deal that's that a big deal that someone who is mixed on the first one thinks this one is phenomenal and you know steve and i were kind of talking about this a little when we were doing dune 2 uh box office predictions uh recently the idea that it's often quite unusual for a film series to to grow in audience and box mm -hmm. office as as you add new installments. I mean, usually what happens with a franchise is the audience narrows and narrows and the challenge is for that not to happen. In this particular case, because of the release strategy with the first Dune movie, we could be in for like a significantly larger box office haul for weekend one. And, you know, the fact that Mike points this quality of the movie out I do think bodes even better for it and, and is pretty much a sure sign that it's yeah. going to be big. 
And I think it helps that it has such an all-star cast of young talent that yes. really appeals to that demographic of moviegoers, which I think a lot of franchises are struggling to get those people into the, the theaters. So I am excited to see how that pays out for them as well. Yeah, I am extremely curious. I feel like we should read Steve's tweet. Which <laughs> I, I don't have it on me because Steve was supposed to be on the show today, but he is he's busy, busy dude. We have so many Collider screenings going on right now, and he's got his hands full with that. So I highly recommend for anyone who hasn't, go over to Collider.com and look up the screenings we have left. Um, you know, we've already done a whole bunch, so some have come and gone, some that you might have wanted to see but have missed, but there's so many more coming up, and he's always adding more to the calendar. But that's why I don't have his tweet handy at the moment but i do want to read it because that's where we got our our episode title from here it is in a shock to no one i absolutely loved dune 2 incredible filmmaking brilliant score entire cast was excellent my only complaint was i wish it was longer not joking around the movie is two hours and 40 minutes and i would have been happy to watch another hour and then he followed that up by saying can't wait to see it in imax next time Steve, Steve, very high on Dune. No, I'm not surprised. He's right. <laughs> um, I can't wait to see it. I'm going to see it fairly soon at this point. And uh, I'm quite eager. Quite eager. Exciting. Yes. All right. Next topic of the day. Actually, before I get into the next topic, I'm going to let you guys know we're going to save a little time at the end of the show today to take more uh, viewer questions than we usually do. So if you are in the live chat right now... I like drop them in, start thinking of them, and then put them in live chat when we call for them towards the end. But we are going to answer as many of your questions as possible. So this next story is about this weekend's box office. This report comes from Deadline. They have uh, some early numbers that uh, signal what is in store for the two uh, the two releases this weekend. First up, Paramount's uh, Bob Marley, One Love, did 3.85 million yesterday. And though it was down 73% from its opening day on Wednesday, that's because it was such a big first day with a record midweek of 14 million. That puts the film in the vicinity of a, wow, um, 65 to $38 million six day opening. I get like six day opening. It's not the, the standard weekend size, but even then I, I feel like that's a, a bigger number than I mm -hmm. might've expected for this film. Yeah, I'm actually really impressed, um, especially since some of the, the critical reviews of it were kind of mixed, I would say, at best. Yeah, so. it does seem that's been been the consensus with that one. Um, and just so you have a little more information, uh, that one has a reported production budget of $70 million. So you mentioned that that movie had some mixed reviews. Um, <laughs> this next one had some... Yes. some very negative reviews. <laughs> yeah. Very negative reviews. Um, I have no problem admitting one of those negative reviews was not from from me. Actually, <laughs> um, I you, found did you enjoy I it more than some people. Did I what? Did you enjoy it more than some people? I, I did, and you know, I, I heavily emphasized in my review. I, I'm not saying that it's that it's a great movie, and I'm certainly not saying it's without its problems, but. I do think that there is some charm to to like the dated campiness of the movie. Yeah. And I also do tend to really enjoy found family stories. And I had enough of a connection to uh, Cassie Webb and then the three young women that she's protecting. So it was enjoyable enough for me. So when I say positive, I'm talking like two and a half out of five. <laughs> on my little Dewey Desa movie scale. So it's certainly not a glowing review. It's barely positive, but I, I'm always going to be honest, no matter what the consensus yes. is. And I enjoyed Madam Web clearly just enough. Anyway, movie did 2.15 million on Thursday. Um, that is apparently down 64% for a two day total of 8.2 million. They're saying, this is deadline, uh, that it could still get 20 million. And then they go on to say, but man, oh man, those audience scores are rough. Two, two stars on post track so far and a 58% from general audiences. Reported production budget on Madam Web is 80 million. So yeah, they're, they're in a little bit of trouble there. A little bit of trouble. Yeah. 
I assume you did not see Madam Web. I have not seen it yet. I'm okay. going to save that one for uh, a home viewing, I think, um, unfortunately, which I think will be sooner rather than later. Um, but I am I am genuinely very excited to see it, even though the reviews are negative. I tend to like campy humor, and I really like when films kind of play to the time period that they're set in. So with this being like a 2000s era film, mm -hmm. the fact that the clips that I've seen from it seem to be very um, similar to the films that came out in that time period, I think I'll end up having like a, a bit of a warm, warm reaction to it. So yeah, there were there were definitely, you know, some shots and other elements of the movie that felt very early 2000s to me. And you know, I like, I, I remember a lot of those movies quite fondly. So I, I was, you know, maybe a little more open minded to that quality of the film than others. And, and I can also understand why others would look at that and criticize the movie. for Yeah, it, so. I mean, so many of the superhero films that I still like hold really like close to my heart are ones that came out then like, you know, lots of conversation this week about Fantastic Four. Yeah, I love the original Ooh. Fantastic Four movies. Are they good? No. Were they good at the time? And do they like hold up for nostalgia? Yeah, sure. They're fine. They're campy. They're exactly what superhero stories kind of work with. And that seems to be maybe what Madam Webb is doing from, you know, the clips that I've seen. So we'll see. One thing I kept saying in my review is, is like, it, it's so, it's not confusing. I think it's actually quite clear, but half of my review was I liked this thing that was intentional. Like I had the reaction that I think they wanted me to have from this thing, but then all these other things I like, I, I think it was an unintentional reaction. I don't think that was what they had planned whatsoever, but I had a positive response to it regardless. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's going to be an interesting one to track going forward. Yeah. All right. Our last official topic of the day before we get to your live questions is something I'm just calling best of the week. Guess why I came up with that subheading for this? A lot of you know I used to host Best of the Week on this uh, YouTube channel a while back, and it was always good fun. In this particular case, we're using it as an opportunity to highlight something that we've watched this week that we think you should be aware of. So, Maggie, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I watched Bleeding Love this week uh, mm. to interview Ewan and Clara. So I really enjoyed that film. It's a really good father-daughter film that digs into some like really difficult topics um, about addiction uh, and you know familiar relationships and stuff like that. So I thought it was a really excellent film. Uh, and that was the only new thing I've watched this week. This week I also rewatched Cloverfield Paradox instead of watching the Super Bowl. <laughs> Have have we spoken about Has Been Hotel, the two of us? No, but it is so good. It, so you're really into it. Yeah, too. I love I'm like theater, and that's like half the cast is musical theater people. It's very. I fun. have I have like a problem with it now. Like I can't I can't listen to any other music but music from that show. I love that that sounds like uh, one of my friends has the same problem. It's like every time she turns her music on, it's like Has Been time. <laughs> That is what it feels like. I'll, I'll use that as a transition to, to my best of the week because, you know, like I like musical theater. I like theater. I admire it. It's it's like a wonderful form of storytelling. Most of my life is, is screen storytelling, though, movies and TV. I am in awe of, of the craft that goes into that. So I just find it funny that that two of my favorite things recently is, is Has Been Hotel a, a, a very R-rated animated musical series from A24 and Amazon. And then the thing that I'm actually going to recommend is, is a Broadway play I saw last night with my mom. Mm -hmm. I I got her tickets to Appropriate for her birthday. And, and last night yes. was the night. And we went and we saw it. And like, my God, I, I think in intermission, I, I turned to her. And like this is such a basic thing to say, but I feel like I needed the reminder of it. Isn't it incredible that those people on that stage are doing that for us, like in this moment right now? And and I emphasize the people on the stage. I'll get to other people involved in that production in a minute, but I bring that up first because it's it's a true performance showcase. Mm -hmm. It's a it's about a a, a family that is uh, you know off offloading their father's estate after his passing, and there's so many little wrinkles along the way. It's a lot more complex than that, but you know they they don't get along. They all have baggage. There's there's certain elements of each other's lives that they don't understand. I could go on and on, and just like the way the way that the that the narrative like uncovers new layers and and lets you start to put pieces together is just 
like, like, it's really like exquisite writing. And then I bring up the cast because every single role in this production demands like a powerhouse performer. Mm-hmm. Everyone has their moment. Every every single scene is is a true dialogue driven banger. I just I couldn't believe how tense two people going at it in a conversation could be. It was just like it was absolutely riveting. Of course, led by Sarah Paulson, who just yep. well, can do no wrong, and she just eats that roll up. It's it's exceptional, exceptional. And then I also wanted to, in particular, highlight that set design. It, it all takes place inside, you know, primarily one room in the house and it's a two, a two story set. Mm-hmm. And it's like the set is cut off in ways where it's so easy to imagine what's like right beyond when a character like goes into the kitchen or goes outside. I thought it was such a smartly designed set. And then also the way that the, the state, like the staging is done really makes the most of it. And then I don't want to spoil this, but like they, they do a couple of man, maybe I I could call them like effects driven things with that Mm -hmm. set. And it it rattled me. It's hard to explain why unless I spoil something, which I'm not going to do, but like it, it rattled me and it made sure that I took so much of that show with me. Like I was, I was uneasy at the end and I I feel like, I don't know, that would, that was a very, very well-earned feeling. I was very impressed by it. So I'm very I'm excited. Very, very envious. I, I don't get to see a lot of live theater anymore. And it's like, I'm, cr- I've been craving for the last couple, couple of weeks to like go back and see something, you know, on Broadway or even the West End. Cause there really is nothing like the experience you have seeing live performances. There's yeah. just this like communal thing that happens that just like, you can feel it when you're in a packed audience seeing a movie, but there's something even more like electric about being there with the performers in the moment and like sharing that a unique one of a kind of experience because every yeah. performance is a little different. Everything yeah. is different every time, which I love. I it's so it. true. So true. I like, I really appreciated that last night and I feel like it's kind of like lit a fire in me to, to see more, more live shows more often, hopefully. Oh, yeah. Aww, we didn't have to ban. We didn't have to remove that person, uh, Niall that Niall Sloan. I was actually going to bring that comment up, Adam. (laughs) Um, So we're going to take some of your live questions and I'll just, I mean, I'll just flat out say it now that I've referenced it. So (laughs) Niall said something to the effect of like, Hey Perry, is Hollywood ever going to stop being woke? If you mean stop being woke by stopping having a a female led movie, I'll I'll question your, your definition of, of woke. I, I find, I find those, those comments and those digs incredibly like boring, thoughtless and, and utterly pointless and misguided. So if you want to keep asking those types of questions, I'll happily answer them because there, there are legitimate answers to them. And I think, uh, I think, uh, we're getting a lot of, uh, boundary pushing movies and, and also movies that, uh, that represent folks that we need to be seeing more of in the past. So, you know what? I'm here for it. Yep. I agree. (laughs) All right. Robin, what's up? What you got for us? Not sure if you already talked about cast, uh, casting being added to the Oscars. Oh, I, Mm -hmm. I've never talked about it, uh, for 2025 movies in an episode. Do you think it'll be best casting for the ensemble overall or best casting for the lead? Did you and John talk about this? We have not talked about this. This is my really, really ready to talk about it. (laughs) This is my favorite Oscar news in a long time. I mean, anytime someone's like, which category do you wish they could add? It's always the same answers. It's always casting, stunts, voice acting. Yep. Casting had to be the priority, I think. Well, stunts, stunts, I'm passionate about stunts too. I mean, yeah. I'm passionate about all of them, but I, I am happy that they, uh, they made casting happen first. It's, I feel like, um, one of the things that I often say is like th- the, these movies don't cast themselves. Yep. And I think that's an important thing to recognize, specifically getting into Robin's question here. I think this award is probably going to take on a whole lot of forms. I I have a feeling the mentality is going to lean towards ensemble, but also ensemble can mean so many things. There's so many movies out there that, you know, one can call a true ensemble piece where a whole bunch of people get a similar amount of screen time. But then 
you know, there's there's others that are still ensemble pieces where you have a clear lead, but like that lead doesn't function as well in the narrative unless they have like pitch perfect people around them. So it's it's going to be interesting what year one is like for this uh, mm -hmm. this award as far as the nominations go. I'm really excited about it. Um, you know, there's so many conversations we have every single year about these films that have like absolutely pitch perfect casting in terms of like a younger, middle aged, older version of characters where it's like you have like seamless transitions between their their phases of their lives. And I feel like that's something that this can really highlight um, going forward with the Oscars because you I mean they're like the unsung heroes of a lot of these you know films finding the perfect person. Yes. So I would love to find another question right now, but we have someone spamming the spamming the live chat. So Adam, if you wouldn't mind banning this individual, that would be wonderful. Um, I'm going to try to to scroll up, up, up. I have lost track of where questions were, unfortunately, though. Um, let's let's pull this. Have you watched uh, any uh, Masters of Air? I have. I've seen about half of it. And then I had to switch gears to, to binge watch something else that I was reviewing, but I loved it so much. Oh, this is a fun fact. The reason why we can't ban this individual is because we're all streaming on Twitter. You're seeing us learn fun facts live on air. <laughs> we'll figure this out. I swear, people. I swear. Um, so you like Masters of Air? I liked it. It was really good. I, I, love, I love war movies and war shows. And so yeah. it fit perfectly with my, my historical niche. Ooh, here's a good question. Best movie about making movies. The correct answer is Urban Legend 2, by the way. I like that, John. Um, um, best movie about making movies. I have a really corny one that I love. What's yours? La La Land. Oh. But because I was not at all in this industry acting or doing any of this when I saw that movie. And I sat there watching that movie and going, I do want to do that. That's what I want to do this, this, I want to do that. And then I started acting the following year. Uh, so that oh, one. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a bit, that's a big deal that yeah, I get that. I, I always cite as the one that I love because I was just like, yeah, that that's what I want. That's, that's what I crave. <laughs> so, so just in case I'm going to answer that in a minute, but just in case anyone is confused when we, uh, when we do collider dailies, we now stream live to YouTube and also to Twitter. So you could watch in one place or the other. Apparently anyone who is in the live chat on YouTube is not seeing the spam. So just in case you're confused by the conversation, that seems to be what's going on. We learn something new every day here. All right. Best movie about making movies. I, I mean, people know I love, love, love La La Land. The year it came out, it was my favorite movie of the year. Other than that, to pick something different, though. Oh, my. It's hard. It's a hard one to, to choose, to choose just one. I feel like I'm thinking... I mean, I, I do like I like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I hate that I can only think of very recent things on the spot right now. It's also what? I, I quite like Hitchcock. Yeah. It's not that's not as recent. I like yeah. Hitchcock. Babylon. There's a lot of I didn't love Babylon. <laughs> I didn't like it either. <laughs> I don't really like it. <laughs> I didn't love Babylon. I guess um the aviator kind of counts. Yeah. <laughs> quite like the aviator. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like I'm forgetting something like even more recent and very obvious right now. And it's bothering me. Well, there's she said, which was recently, which is about the darker side of Hollywood. Um, uh, that is true. That definitely counts. Yeah. I quite like she said that was one of those movies where I was. Uh, I mean, at a point, this wasn't true, but at the beginning, as it was leading up to its release, I was feeling pretty good about it breaking into the Oscar race. And then it's just like it. it it came and went and yeah. it did not get near enough attention, which, which kind of broke my heart a little bit. Um, but yeah, disaster artist. What else we got? Anyone else have one that they really like? Uh, Dolomite is my name. There you go. There you That's go. Cool. I haven't rewatched that movie since it came out. Maybe I should. Um, let's take one more question and then we will call it a day. I asked this question earlier in the chat. Thoughts on the surprise news that Anya Teller Joy is in Dune 2. Maggie, do you know who she's playing in Dune 2? Yes, oh, and I, I don't want to spoil it for people. Oh, 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 oh. I think people were still trying to keep that one under wraps. Um, I see. So maybe let's just talk about Anya as an actor. Yeah, she, she's definitely maybe in it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I think she's a wonderful actor. I think she's, again, one of like the brightest, like starlet types that we have right now. She just also seems to have a really cool vibe. Like every time I see her and her husband show up to like some sort of like fashion show or something, they look like something out of the 80s, like the Hollywood starlet and the, like the rocker boyfriend vibe. It's very cool. <laughs> and this might surprise people, but like, I don't care much for fashion. <laughs> but I can't I, believe this. <laughs> I will tell you, I am mesmerized by the red carpet photos associated with Dune 2. Oh my gosh. And, like, every single photo feels like the promo campaign is essentially saying like, look how pretty our ensemble is. And I, I'm just eating it up right now. I loved Leah's outfit. Her dress was fantastic. <sighs> there, uh, there was a lot. Um, clearly, John has spoiled Dune for everybody. And Taylor Joy is a sandworm. All right. With that, we're going to head out for the weekend. Is there anything you would like to promote? Anything you want people to watch or read over the weekend? Yes, I had three interviews that dropped this week for the new look with uh, Ben Mendelsohn, Maisie Williams, and John Malkovich. And then my last of them drop um, hopefully on Sunday. And then I have a whole bunch of interviews coming out next week for The Bad Batch. Uh, I have one with Colin O'Donoghue and then The Bleeding Love Junket with Ewan and Clara, which I'm really excited for because there's some good stuff in there. Very nice, very nice. I'm trying to remember what my ladies' night rotation was. We had a midweek episode, actually, mm -hmm. because Sophie Wilde, who is the star of Talk to Me, exceptional performance, was honored for her performance. She was nominated for a Rising Star Award at the BAFTAs, and uh, we wanted to make sure to get that episode up and running so that we drew some attention to that nomination to help give her a boost there, because she deserves it. She's exceptional in the film, and I'm so excited that horror has broken through in the awards race. So that one is up and running on this channel right now. And then from there, I'm not telling you anything. I'm keeping them a surprise. Keeping them a surprise. I swear it's not because I can't remember who they are, but I have like a weird thing where I need to see one cut mm. before I believe that they exist. Like I, ta I taped one yesterday, Maggie. I taped it. The footage is in my inbox. I know it exists, but I won't say it until I've watched cut one. I love that. I mean, I always live in fear that like something's going to happen to the footage in between like that and, that and be like, well, it's gone now. It never happened. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, I'm glad it's I'm glad it's not just me, um, but you'll have lots to look out for in the next week or two. With that, I will say have a lovely weekend and we will be back on Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific for a brand new edition of Collider Dailies.